The Nightmare Before Christmas has become one of this fall's major hits with its creepy creature meets Kris Kringle story. But it is the music that has Leonard Maltin going boingo. Leonard. Well, John, 10 years ago, Danny Elfman was known as a member of the offbeat group Oingo Boingo. Then he wrote the irresistible music score for Pee Wee's Big Adventure and launched himself on a career as a film composer that's still soaring. If you saw Batman or Midnight Run or even Summersby, or if you watched The Simpsons, you've heard his music. And now he's added another feather to his cap with the songs and score for The Nightmare Before Christmas. What is this? It's someplace new. Not your ordinary animated film, and not your traditional Hollywood musical. The Nightmare Before Christmas is full of fresh and original ideas. Some from the mind of creator Tim Burton, and others from the musical imagination of composer and performer Danny Elfman. A charter member of the rock group Boingo Boingo, Danny has now become a respected film composer, and he agreed to show me around his workplace. What you don't see here is the apparatus that they set up behind the chair that holds my eyes open like a <laughs> clockwork orange. Danny's high-tech workshop enabled him to create professional-sounding demo tapes of all the songs for Nightmare Before Christmas and try them out for Tim Burton and director Henry Selleck. What's this? There's white things in the air. What's this? I can't believe my eyes. I must be dreaming. Wake up, Jack. This isn't fair. What's this? What Elfman hadn't anticipated was doing the singing voice of his central character, Jack Skellington. I did the demos, and at a certain point, I went to Tim, and I said... There's a lot of better singers than, than I am, but Jack is for me. He's, he is me, and um, Tim agreed. Developing the character with Tim was really, was just great. Suddenly, I really got to dig my hands into something and, and create uh, with this image, with this incredible image that Tim had given me, and, and these pictures, he had these great drawings that he'd done. And then to kind of flesh it out and try to bring it to life in the songs was really was really wonderful. And we wanted to make it a real old-fashioned musical where the story is being told in the songs. Danny's respect for film music is enormous, but he's also inspired by a house full of artifacts he's gathered around the world, from Mexican Day of the Dead skeletons to a shrunken head and a disembodied finger of long ago. No wonder he identifies so strongly with the skeletal character in Nightmare Before Christmas. As bizarre as some of this may seem, and as wild as Oingo Boingo can get, when it comes to composing, Danny is serious and enthusiastic. No electronics for him. He's hooked on the sound of an orchestra. The whole fun of it, the whole insanity of it, is getting there in front of 70, 80, 90 pieces and, uh, and wrestling with this thing and getting it to sound right. It's such a great high. And that sound is a real high for moviegoers, too. So now correct me if I'm wrong. This looks like fun, this looks like fun. Oh, could it be? I got my wish. What's this? He's a very talented fellow, and I look forward to everything he has on his slate, including his dream project, a live-action musical. That's something that will be worth waiting for. Sounds like he could, could have a singing future, too. Oh, yeah. He definitely <laughs> yeah. I mean, His performances with Oingo Boingo are legend. Yes, well, and his singing on the track of uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is wonderful. Right. Thanks, Hunter. Thank you. Our almonds to be a little indulgent. Right. Halloween's been my favorite night of the year since I was six years old. It was the one night that I really waited for. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, doesn't everybody <laughs> get to dress up, free candy? It's great. I tell you, the older I've gotten, the more I like Halloween. It is an adult's uh, holiday in lots of ways. <laughs> I've always loved it, just for the uh, from point of greed, going out with uh, pillowcases. We carry pillowcases on Halloween. You know, you see these other kids with a little plastic jack-o'-lanterns, jack and what are you going to get with that? <laughs> I love the imagery. I've collected Day of the Dead images for 20 years. Uh, my house is filled with skeletons and mummified objects. And it's always fun dressing up. Obviously, if I've gone into acting, I'm just like being other people, so Halloween was a great excuse for that. I am the Pumpkin King! Hi, I'm Danny Elfman. Some of you may know me as a film composer. Some of you may know me as the lead singer in a rock band called Oingo Boingo. Most of you probably don't know me at all, but that's not the point. I'm here to introduce you to the songs that I've composed and performed for a slightly unusual character named Jack Skellington. Now, Jack Skellington is the star of the new musical fantasy from the twisted mind of Mr. Tim Burton. 
Are you ready for the nightmare before Christmas? We've got to find Jack! There's only 365 days left till next Halloween! 364! You have to imagine that every holiday is conjured up by this holiday world. And all they've got to do is make holiday all year long for this one night. Now, our story takes place in Halloween land. Jack Skellington is the Pumpkin King. But you're the Pumpkin King. Not anymore. And I feel so much better now. He's got a little problem. He's been the Pumpkin King for too long, and he's getting a little sick of it. And he's sick of all the glory and all the people, um, adulation, uh, always complimenting him. He wants something else. He doesn't know what it is. What is this? It's someplace new. So wandering out in the forest one day, he discovers a door. It's the door to Christmas land. He gets sucked into the door and discovers this new world, Christmas, and he loves it. What's this? What's this? There's color everywhere. What's this? There's white things in the air. What's this? I can't believe my eyes. I must be dreaming. Wake up, Jack. This isn't fair. There's a great song that Danny Elfman wrote called What's This? And he knows there's something in the air, but he doesn't know what it is. But he knows he wants to do Christmas. So... He goes back to Halloween Town with the idea of doing Christmas this year instead of Christmas doing Christmas. What's this? The streets are lined with little creatures laughing. Everybody seems so happy. Have I possibly gone daffy? What is this? What's this? He's Jack at his highest moment. Um, he falls into this world and he's like a kid. Everything amazes him. What's this? What's this? There's color everywhere. What's this? There's bright things in the air. What's this? I can't believe my eyes. I must be dreaming. Wake up, Jack. This isn't fair. This is a thing called a present. The whole thing starts with a box. A box? Is it steel? A box? Is it filled with a box? A box? How do I look a box? Of course, he has a tough Just time selling that right, to Halloween Land because he comes back things. full of enthusiasm. I must tell you about this incredible thing. And he calls a town meeting. Now he's got a tough call because he's, he's stolen all these things from Christmas Land to try to show. They don't understand. He shows them a sock. And they go, a sock? Oh, does it still have a foot? Let me see, let me look. Is it rotted, covered with gook? He's trying and trying. They just don't get it. Sally, I need your help more than anyone's. You certainly do, Jack. I had the most terrible vision. That's splendid. No, it was about your Christmas. There was smoke and fire. The main character plays Sally, a girl who's really in love with Jack Skellington. And she senses that this is not something he should be doing, that he's in over his head or <laughs> under his head or somewhere. And, uh, and that he shouldn't be trying to take over Christmas. He sure is big, Jack. And Harry! Let's be out! Sandy Claus. In person. He wants to what give them the best Christmas ever. So he kidnaps Santa Claus, which he calls Sandy Claus, and um, proceeds to do Christmas. And, of course, he makes a complete mess of it, and they shoot him out of the air. The armies has to be called in. And... Uh, <laughs> Of course, he realizes how badly he messed things up, and he has to set everything right, which he does, and it's a nice, happy ending. And what did Fletcher bring you, honey? Merry Christmas! It has a lot of wit, um, and it has very adult themes in it, but at the same time, it, uh, you know, it's really the story, which I think is so universal of, and, and so like all of Tim's characters of his films. It's a, someone in search of himself. There's a sweetness to his work and a light to his work. Even though he's, he, he seems to love the dark, too. There's always a, a lightness that pulls you out of it. It's okay. It's okay. It's a bad. It's a bad. It's a bad. It's the head that I found in the lake. It has the Burton look <laughs> and the Burton feel and the Burton touch. It wasn't like any of our live action movies. It wasn't like any of our, uh, animated films of the past uh it's completely new and different and we were attracted to that at this time in the company's growth you know i think that they saw uh that uh you know it's a very simple story you know it's very simple in a way and so they just sort of uh you know said okay i met him years ago at disney studios we were uh, two malcontents who sort of fell together uh, with dreams of doing more interesting projects, and then in the late 70s. It was a time at Disney where it's like I just had, you know, just drawing things, you know, they, they didn't want me to draw Fox anymore because they were looking too deformed. 
Tim was, uh, even at a very young age, a spectacular talent. And there were a few people at Disney who were willing to give him a chance to develop a few projects. Greenlight, very few. One of those projects was Nightmare Before Christmas. Finally, Tim was at a point where he wanted to take uh, Nightmare out of mothballs. Disney said, please give us a chance. We want to work with you. We'll give you autonomy. And Rick Heinrichs, who'd been there from the start, got me and Tim back together. And, you know, we plugged in and uh, have had a great collaboration ever since. Hello, Ogie. Jack! What is that you were dead? There was something about the three-dimensional animation that I always found uh, in certain instances to be more powerful, more real. I I've never liked animation just for animation's sake. I always think it should, you know, it should just serve whatever the story or, or, or is. After having gone through many different types of animation techniques, um, stop motion for me is the best of live action in the best of cartoon animation. You get to have the incredible invention and fantasy of cartoon animation. You can't do it as easily, but you can have fantastic characters that you could never have in live action. Surprised, aren't you? I knew you would be. As you can see, stop motion animation has come a long way since Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer flew across your TV screens. When the features continues, we will show you the innovative new methods used to bring the Nightmare Before Christmas to life. There's something about people moving a figure and breathing life into it that uh, is very exciting. There's an energy to that. It's a beautiful art form. It's a very special person who could be an animator, you know, because he, it requires a lot of patience and it requires uh, you, know, you to be an artist. And those are sometimes, you know, the artistic impulse, which is, in my, more spontaneous to me, and that then the patience required are very hard things to integrate. I mean, it takes a special crazy person to do it. <laughs> Basically what you do is you pose Jack, take a picture of him, you repose him, you might raise an arm, turn the head step back, take another picture. You're doing this in very fine amounts. You do it 24 times a second. Um, and when you're done animating a scene after three or four days, you've animated a few hundred uh, frames. You play it back and you might have five seconds of Jack Skellington without any hands in there touching him being alive. There's a process that you, that you see it unfolding as, you know, maybe 10% of the animation is done and then 20 and then 50 and then 60, you know, till you finally reach, you know, all of it being animated two and a half years later. This is our Sally show. As you can see, we have uh, puppets up here that are in uh, various cases of repair. Some of them are stand-in puppets. Others are ready for shots. For fabrication, uh, Sally was very difficult. She had... Um, she had so many different parts. She, like Jack, had a replacement series. Hers were snap-on faces, like masks. This is a, a kit that shows Sally very sad. This one, for example, which is one of my favorites, although it doesn't get used very often, is Sally very angry. We'll fit a photograph of each head into this computer. Then we pick a head to match each syllable of the character's dialogue or song. This establishes which head or mouth position the animator will use. To do a smile, they have to go like, they have a head that's here, they take it off, they put on a head that's here, they take it off, they put it on a head here, 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 here. Amazing. And then in scenes where, you know, like the town meetings, where they, you think of all those characters that they had to manipulate. Sandy Claus. In person. Over here, I'd like to show you what an armature looks like. Each one is very intricate. Fits perfectly so it has a nice, smooth movement. 
And this is what's contained within each and every one of these puppets. This is the main uh, workroom for the fabrication department. This is where we originally create the puppets, put their new paint job on when they first are made, and this is where they come up for repair and maintenance, kind of like a, a hospital or a clinic for our puppets. Let me explain. There's no foot inside, but there's candy. Or sometimes it's filled with small toys. Small toys? Do they bite? They snap or explode in a sack? Or perhaps they just spring out and scatter over the floor. Seeing the first animation come back, um, it looked so much better than I'd imagined in my head that it really was a great motivating force because they did a phenomenal job. And uh, I'd imagined what I thought it would look like. And it looked much better than that. I think it's amazing looking. And, and uh, if you have the slightest bit of knowledge, which is as much as I have, about stop frame anima animation and what it entails, it's unbelievable the, the, um, the work that's gone into this. I looked in every mausoleum. We opened the sarcophagi. Oh, they trumped through the pumpkin patch. When you see the movie and you see the detail in, say, a crowd scene in the town square of all these figures moving and, and, and understand the complexities of, of what they had to do to get each of them moving, you could see it again and again and again and still, you know, try to pick up something you didn't get before because of the amount of detail. Acting's hard enough, but imagine trying to create a character by just using your voice will sound off about that fiendish challenge when E features The Nightmare Before Christmas continues. Next! Fantastic! Now, why don't you all practice on that? And we'll be in great shape. When Tim started describing the character to me, it didn't take a lot of searching in my own soul to find what Jack Skellington is. Um, there's so much of my own personality and his personality, the uh, getting very enthusiastic and then plunging down into this melancholy state. I mean, that's me. Jack, I know you think something's missing, but... Ow! Sorry. You start doing voices and, and you know, from reading it, and, and they sent me the pictures, you know, all the drawings of Sally, and that kind of gives you an idea of how she might sound. I actually, at the beginning, tried to do more of a broken voice because I thought her voice is untogether as her body, you know, is stitched up as her body. But, um, but that kind of thing, I just think, can get in the way after a while. It's like, okay, enough with the broken voice. So... <laughs> now and forever, for it is plain as anyone can see. It's definitely a different kind of acting because they are dealing in, you know, you know, milliseconds almost, you know, cause, because they stop and move something, you know, and then they shoot, then they move, then they shoot, then they, everything's manually moved in between, you know, a split second of a shot. So in the acting, you're dealing in seconds almost too, so there's a lot of uh, focus on, you know, a, two words in a line or, you know, or at the most one line, the way it fits in, and, and uh, you know, Henry Selleck is, is thinking in these split seconds, so that's, that's the way you work when you're doing the lines, too. It's a, it's a different kind of acting. They always had the storyboards there when we were doing the voices, and Henry would always go through, you know, what, what exactly was happening, and he was always uh, very clear about, you know, they're being thrown down a chute now, and you got to scream, and you scream for this long and not this long, and, you know. So, yeah, they were very, they were very good at giving us a visual idea of, of what we were, you know, voicing. He's ancient! He's ugly! I don't know which is worse! They have you record the whole thing first, and then they animate or do the stop action to the vocal tracks. They took some, some footage, I think, when I was recording the song uh, for some facial things, you know. Being a stage actor, I can't do it without doing it all, you know. So they taped some of that. I think they did use I, the clips that I've seen so far. I did see a few things that looked like, I said, well, that looks like me a little bit and inside that burlap. Well, come on! Oh, man! The communication between Tim and I was also very, very straight, very clean, and very clear. So it was probably the easiest time I've ever had uh, working with him in the sense that he would talk about it a little bit, we'd talk about a little bit of the story, and I'd hear the song as he was talking, and I'd almost have to shoo him out the door and begin the three days later, say, you want to hear it? I've never known 
worked with him on every movie and it's been great. You know, he's just another character in the movies, really, you know, and uh, and then this was a new thing, and, uh, you know, so it was it was great. The children throwing snowballs instead of throwing heads. The busy building toys, and absolutely no one's dead. There's frost in every window. Oh, I can't believe my eyes. And in my bones, I feel the warmth that's coming from inside. Danny has an ability of such power in his music, and he can just force you along. And at the same time, he can drop back and do uh, a ballad that is so beautiful. And I don't know many that has can have the edge and the, the, the force of his music and at the same time can have the, the beauty of it as well. And sit together now and forever. I've known Catherine, because I knew her since Beetlejuice. So with Catherine and Paul Rubens, a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman, it was like working with old friends. I'd worked with them both. And the three of us did the scheming, uh, the Trick and Treaters, Trick or Treaters song, Lock, Shock, and Barrel. So that was just pure fun. The uh, shock was easier because it's real character singing and because I had, you know, Danny and, and Paul for support. But um, I mean, we supported each other. Um, but doing my Sally song, that was scary because I've only done really kind of uh, character singing. We're simply meant to be At some points I'd sound like, you know, a choir boy. I excused it by saying, you know, Sally's not that well formed, so it's okay that she can't sing that well. When Mr. Oogie Boogie says there's trouble close at hand. Ken was fantastic. He was so enthusiastic. And I'd never worked with a pro before. I'd never worked with a real pro. So I'm used to working with just people who do this and do that and do other things. And, you know, Catherine is not a professional singer and Paul's not a professional singer. And, um, here suddenly is Ken Page. Not that I didn't love working with Catherine and Paul, but Ken comes in and he's like, wow, this guy really goes. Santa Claus, uh, ooh, I'm really scared. So you're the one everybody's talking about. <laughs> the Nightmare Before Christmas continues right after this. Every uh, Christmas you'd watch things like uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or uh, like The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Those were my favorite uh, uh, holiday specials when I was growing up. I grew up really liking those shows, but I think this will blow them away. My Christmas is filled with laughter and joy. It'll be a holiday classic. It's hard to say. You know, it's like I feel really good about the movie. You know, I, I love it and, and I can... It's, they did a really, it's a beautiful job, you know, and, and um, so I don't know, I, you know, I'll watch it every year, I don't know, <laughs> be my own, you know, my own personal holiday classic. Merry Christmas! And what is your name? I hope kids discover it. My own daughter, starting at seven, began approving all the music for me. She's really the executive music producer, Molly, but, uh, her and her friends have seen footage as it came in over a two-year period, and they love the stuff. <laughs> That's not Sandy Claus. It isn't. Who is it? The next holiday land, um, maybe uh, Valentine's Day. You know, because he's got Sally, and there's the whole, you know, the, there is a love thing there. I think actually Valentine's Day you could have some fun with different, a lot of different characters and people falling in love, and Jack trying inadvertently to, you know, come in between those, you know, that kind of a feeling. That could be interesting. Be careful with Sandy Claus when you fetch him. Treat him nicely. Oh, we thought Thanksgiving land would be, I mean, wouldn't you just love to spend a couple hours in Thanksgiving world? John the Turkey King is about to get his head chopped off because it's Thanksgiving, and he decides that he doesn't want to. He wants to go off and find something else. And, um, and of course, at the end of the story, he realizes that all the turkeys make people very happy. So he, as he's about to put his head on the chopping block, there he sees John 912 getting crowned for the next year. He realizes that life goes on. What do you think? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, you know, there's, there's unlimited holidays, so we could do a lot of sequels. At this point, I hope that's not my ne next movie. <laughs> We've reached the end of our look at The Nightmare Before Christmas. 
on behalf of Jack Skellington and friends, enjoy the nightmare and enjoy the holidays. This is Danny Elfman. Goodbye. Coming up next, it's time for E Stand Up Sit Down Comedy with the comedy of, we said comedy twice, but that's okay, Mike McDonald. This is.